Hi, we're at GAD 2015 in Amsterdam, and I'm speaking with Jamie Woodruff. Jamie, how are you today? I'm very well, thank you. I have a question for you. In fact, I have several. Um, I'll jump straight in. So, what, if you think about the airport industry, what do you think is the single biggest risk that people leading these airports should be aware of? Just technology, technological changes, uh, advancements. I mean, as the more and more people get devices, the more threats and vulnerability it comes. I mean, before um, we, we pass obviously x-ray every single day with your devices, and then you come out to the airport and you can just sit and play on them, but there's so many things wrong from like a networking perspective, so you're able to um, potentially intercept and see data, um, watch what other people are doing inside of airports. I mean, over like 70% of airports are affected by this. So any, um, uh, any, any employee or um, customer or a client of the airport could be sat there and just watching what other people are doing. I suppose it's the technology, isn't it? It's, it's the social engineering aspects, the, the fishing aspects. And, that's pretty much it. Just for, because a lot of uh, the people actually working in airports, they are trying to catch up with new technology, they're trying to understand it. Could you describe like an example of, of what such a, such a risk would look like in real life if it, if such, take an employee, what, I mean, what could they it could be it, the, the risk could be anything, I mean it could be even disgruntled employees. I find that throughout all businesses, not just the airport industry. From like a disgruntled employee, you can um, be able to, for example, I found one in um, a lead online company, online uh, flight company, I was able to pay the employee 80 pounds to get a jacket for cabin crew. So it's that disgruntled employee obviously didn't take his job seriously, put out the cereals and then I was able to obtain uh, a cabin crew jacket. If you look on uh, eBay for an example, there's hundreds and hundreds of different cabin crew uniforms that you can purchase. So imagine if you're in the airport, you go past security, you don't get your bags checked, you get into the airport, you wear an ID card just like this that I was able to obtain online that says Virgin Atlantic, walk around the airport and then other people will um, feel for you type thing. They'll be able to introduce you, interact with them, you can blend into the environment. So I suppose it's social engineering is probably one of the biggest factors. So what you're actually describing is all the technology and all the systems that have been put in place to prevent this happening are actually, in fact, making it easier to, for this to happen. Yeah, exactly. I mean, um, even CCTV cameras, everything nowadays runs on the internet. It runs on the network, whether it's an internal network, an intranet, or whether it's an external network, like the World Wide Web. So everything's always connected to that, like online booking systems, third-party booking vendors. Um, obviously, they share data, third-party data. How many third-party companies work inside of airline industry? I mean, you've got Menzies, you've got um, different ground crew, all owned by a third-party company that have access to these airports. So who vets the employees? Who goes through um, their past history, their previous histories? I mean, um, for, for an example, there's a, a PA of a director. She, um, she left, so the director needed a new uh, PA, uh, let's say, inside the airline industry. So they brought her on board. And then um, they didn't vet her, give her all access to everything that she needed. After two weeks, she disappeared with everything that she wanted. So that was a disgruntled employee or a disgruntled individual that went in for a malicious purpose. So, I mean, I'd look at more of the third party aspects. I mean, in airports, there's third parties make up a big part of the income, but they're also a big part of the critical security infrastructure. Yeah. In fact, actually, it's really a trend to do even more of this outsourcing to third parties. And I think that outside of the, the security aspect, there are many other difficult aspects, right, in a complicated organization with working with third parties. What, what can airports actually do? Let's stick to this, this topic a bit of a disgruntled employee or, or security around a crew and em employees. What, what could airports actually do to prevent this from happening? There's no way to prevent this. This is the thing. I mean, the threat exists. It's just about making sure that you've got steps in place to handle about this threat. I mean, how can you tell if someone's a disgruntled employee? I mean, there was someone, for instance, um, working at a large airport in the UK. Um, I think there was a news reference online for it a few years ago. And uh, all, he had links to Al-Qaeda and no one knew. And he part, trained as part of cabin crew, got accepted as part of cabin crew. Then they found out later on that he had links to all these um, third party terrorist groups. But that's because, just because he was on a watch list getting watched. Um, by the UK security services. So it's all down to the fact that you need to make sure that you, you understand your third parties, you, you understand your employees. Um, the chief risk officers, um, the managers understand the protocols to do. I mean, for instance, if you've got an aware side pass and you can't get into airports, um, and, and just making sure that they keep to them, to them steps, let's say. Yeah. Do you think it's, so when you say you can't actually prevent this, Although security there are... through obscurity. You can't prevent it, but instead of doing the same thing that everybody else follows, following the same frameworks and guidelines, think differently. Do something differently to help with your security that no one's aware of. 
I mean, we see from like an airline perspective, there's hundreds of thousands of schematics and layouts of networking cables inside of airports. I was looking at a PDF today from Cisco, and it shows you the infrastructure of how it's wired. So that's publicly available because they want to show people that they're able to do the job and carry out the job. Yeah, yeah. But from a hacking perspective, that's intelligence that I'm able to use against the airport itself. So it's about making sure that not everything is online. I mean, like um, the IntelliBus systems by um, Boeing, for an example. All the um, schematics and stuff about the layout of the software and system is online. The voltages, the frequencies that they work out when, you, when you're in the air. But all this stuff is publicly available stuff, right. which I can use to build a t an attack tool or an attack vector or to gain access to a, 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 a target ethically. So everything I do is follow a strict guidelines. I don't just willy-nilly start attacking things. I have to have authorization, verbal, written consent. Um, so it's about making sure that not everything is publicly available. Yeah, or, or maybe only if you want to give a showcase like Cisco that you only show part of it that nobody else can use to... Exactly, yeah, that, exactly. I mean, instead of like, instead of showing them the nitty-gritty bits of how the software works, just show them the, the GUI or the graphical interface of the application, you might be able to build up a tiny knowledge vector of, of what information is inside the application. But you won't understand how it works. You won't understand the software behind it. I mean, in the transportation industry, not just airlines itself, we find a lot of people use Bluetooth. Yeah. Well, Bluetooth's one of the most hackable um, wireless technologies that are out there and available. And I mean, cars have been hacked through Bluetooth. Buses have been hacked through Bluetooth. Train systems through Bluetooth. And now, I don't think it's going to be too difficult for the airlines when they do implement um, Bluetooth technology that there'll be something available for hackers to exploit. I know, for instance, another one that I'll highlight today um, from a, an, an airline perspective is the in-flight entertainment system. Yeah. Now, the in-flight entertainment system, you're able to um, you're able to gain access via the USB port to gain access to the thrust control system, so you can effectively fly the aircraft with a handheld device or a laptop. This threat exists. There's hundreds of thousands of news articles. CNN published one on the 11th of March this year. Um, BBC published a story in June about a guy called Chris Roberts and he was able to take over the aircraft, um, not maliciously, and then start tweeting in the air about it. Ground crew found out he was tweeting and he got grounded and banned from all commercial aircrafts. But this threat exists on pretty much all Boeing, I mean, seven, seven, Boeing 777 fleets um, that are, are mainly used by British Airways. Yeah. For instance, their engineering, uh, part of the engineering bay is actually located in the galley um, towards door one. Now that's got an actual um, computer system in, in there that's used by engineering. But if you was able to plug something in, you can gain access to the onboard navigation equipment, first controls, and then control the aircraft from again inside of your seat. Right. So basically what you're saying, all this checking for little bottles of uh, facial cream is, is really worthless Ridiculous. compared to this type of well, yeah, risk. I mean, so you're, for instance, right, 250 milligrams. If you're in a 10,000 feet pressurized container, yeah, you could get a chewing gum piece this much that are blowing air, blow, blowing air inside. The pressure on the outside would then in turn cause the aircraft to just deteriorate. It doesn't matter. The 250 mil is just not an example. Imagine if you had 10 people booked on that flight, each with 250 mil. Yeah. You can't exactly. test the liquids. I mean, how many people, thousands of people go through the airport every single day, thousands go through x-rays every single day. Um, but I think it's, it's about um, showing people that the threat kind of exists. Yeah. Making people aware to wake up to the threat. I mean, for instance, like plastic explosives can be mimicked as chewing gum, for an example. Okay, yeah. And then push chewing gum on side. You're allowed to carry a lighter on one lighter per person. Like that, a tiny hole all of a sudden becomes a massive hole. That is pretty scary. Is there one, one question I, I, I also have is, is around your earlier comments about the um, insider abuse of, of information and data. Yeah. Would it help if airports start to think more about parceling information so that no one single person controls the entire chain needed to, for instance, give somebody access? Yeah, I mean, normally it's down to like the chief risk office of the airport to kind of analyze that. I mean, the infrastructure that you've got in place is this, there's hundreds and hundreds of routers all the way around the airport. There's a data centers in most airports that control the actual equipment. Then you've got disaster recovery in case there's any um, terrorist attacks. So you've got backup systems that you can use for like NATS air traffic control. But I think the difficulty in itself is the fact that there's so much information, everybody wants to make it a smooth sailing. So when we brought the e-gates, yeah, I've gone through the e-gates several times when one of um, the, uh, the the TAS or a part of the actual security team is sat there like this. Yeah. And he's not even bothered about the pictures that appear on the screen. Or the sounds coming out. So I was flying from Malaysia um, last week and because I was flying first class and I had a suit on, I went through and the buzzer went off because of my shoes and my pants. He said, it's like, fine, just go. He didn't even bother to search. I had keys in my pocket. I had 
um, coins in my pocket, I had lighter in my pocket because I hadn't had time, he was just rushing me through. Yeah. But that, I could have had anything in my pocket. So it's basically also saying, even without cybersecurity, if you don't have people you to can do tell, the basic yeah, things. Exactly, you can tell which employees want to work there nine till five. You can tell which people want to go home to the children. Give somebody a pack of biscuits and they'll tell you the life story. Meet someone in the airport that sat down on their own drinking coffee. Cabin crew frequently drink coffees in airports before the flights. Just get talking to them and you can learn numerous things about the infrastructure. Yeah, exactly. So if you had like, for, for, for the people here, uh, uh, mostly industry executives, if you had like to give them one word of advice, what, what, what to do when they get back to their airports, Use what carrier pigeons instead of email. <laughs> so if I had one piece of advice, it's just make sure everybody has access to the only the things that they need access to. So for instance, ground crew have access to the ground. Do, do other staff members need access to the ground? ID cards, how often did he change the ID cards? How often did he change the passcodes? How often did he change and upgrade the policies? So I'd review, do, do an audit of everything about current modern technologies. Look at your network infrastructure, look at your IT infrastructure. Um, look at the way that everything's set out inside of the airport. Look at how the, um, the RFID uh, tags work. You can actually, with a device like myself, this is a black phone, one of the world's most secure smartphones. I can clone ID cards with my phone and then use that to gain access to it. Without having the yeah, right without, to have access. Exactly, yeah. So RFID technology is wireless technology, so I'm able to clone the card, save it to my phone as erg side crew or a ground crew, and then they type the codes in. They just stand there and everybody can see the digits. So one of the doors from, um, from Manchester I was flying one yesterday was 18936, which was the one to go and take me to the aircraft. So she just typed that in and I was watching, just another guy in the crowd just watching. But how often does that code get changed? Yeah, absolutely. I hope it gets changed now. Thank you very much, Jamie.